Hi, I'm Sandy Ray, founder of Sandra E. Ray CPA, where we alleviate financial headaches so that you can create a bigger impact. Today, we're going to talk about your chart of accounts. And specifically, we're going to talk about QuickBooks, but the basic principles here apply to any accounting software that you're using. We want to explain how nonprofits should be using their chart of accounts to pull information out of their system that they need for management, for compliance purposes, and for grant applications. So I want to get started is like, what is the chart of accounts? Basically, it's a listing of categories of how we're going to categorize our transactions. And of course, generally accepted accounting principles pretty much dictates that we're going to have a certain type of structure where we're able to track our assets, our liabilities, our revenue, and our expense. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and share my screen because I want to dive right into it. And I want you to see the practical application of what we're talking about, which sometimes I think we do a lot of talking and not showing. So the basic statements are the statement of financial position, which is our assets, our liabilities, and our net assets. That gives us the snapshot of where we are today or as of a certain date in the time period. The next report is our statement of activities. That's our revenue and our expenditures. That gives us our financial activity over a certain period of time, whether it's last month, last quarter, last year, those kinds of things. Not-for-profits also have a statement of functional expenses where we list by natural category what our expenses are, like salaries and office supplies but we report them by program or by management in general and by fundraising. Mm -hmm. This is very important for not only for our audited financial statements, but also for our form 990. And then finally, we have the statement of cash flows. And that's just a representation of, if you're a cruel based accounting system, bringing that net revenue back to the change in cash over a certain time period. And we're not really covering that statement today because it's not part of the account structure. It's more of a way of pulling the information and doing that adjustment between accrual and cash to do that. So first, I want to talk to you about the statement of financial position. And right here, I have a sample statement. As I said, this is really as of today. So we've got, we're going to list our assets first. And we're going to go in the order of most liquid to least liquid. So that's the order of this. Sometimes you'll see current assets versus long term. I didn't put those distinguishments in here, but I wanted you to see what we've got. We've got right here first is our cash and our cash equivalents. Obviously, that is the most liquid. Cash equivalents is just anything that can be turned into cash within 90 days. So if you have a short 30-day CD or certificate of deposit, that would go in here. Anything less than 90 days. We're breaking that down between like our checking, which is non-interest bearing, our non-interest bearing accounts. You may have more than one and you'll want to list them here in our savings. And then, like I said, anything else that can be turned into cash within 90 days. Our next section is generally our receivables. We're going to have our pledges and our grants receivable, and we want to report that at net. So what do we think is our allowance for doubtful accounts? What will we not collect? And then if those receivables are scheduled out for more than one year, we have to do a present value calculation and net that discount so that our pledges receivable are at net. Same thing for accounts receivable. If you've got program services where you're billing someone, you're going to want to include that allowance for doubtful accounts so that we're reporting it net. And then any other receivables you may have, maybe it's interest receivable from investments, loans, and notes receivable, you're going to want to report those here as well. And again, if there's an allowance for doubtful accounts or net present value discount, we need to report that here. The next big category is inventory, whether you're inventorying items for sale, like on your website store, 
or maybe you purchased a bunch of fundraising that you're giving away and you're going to be using those over several years. We're going to inventory those. One client, we are inventorying the Bomba socks because they receive a huge shipment in one year and they use it over the next 12 months. That 12 months crosses their fiscal year. So we're actually inventorying the Bomba socks. And as we give them away, we are recognizing the related in-kind expense. Prepaid expenses, those are for things like deposits on space for venues for fundraising events, or maybe you have a security deposit for your office. This could be your insurance. Many times insurance policies don't coincide with our fiscal year. We've got some prepaid expense because we've paid for the annual insurance policy, but some of the coverage is for in our next fiscal year. Our fixed assets, our land, our building, our equipments, our vehicles, those are going to go on here. And then we're reporting these at not. The accumulated depreciation goes here as well. We've got investments. I've put it down here at the bottom because sometimes investments are, are long-term rather than shorter term. But if these were short-term investments, I mean, you may have two sections of investments, some that are very liquid that you're going to put like towards the top of the statement and then some that are longer term. Our intangibles, if you have any of those, patents, trademarks, those kinds of things, the value of those, and then other assets. So we're going to come up with our total assets. And then the next section is net assets and liabilities. These two together should equal the total assets. We've got liabilities. Again, this goes in the order of liquidity. Accounts payable usually gets paid first, accrued expenses, any grants payable, deferred revenue. Have we received income that we haven't earned yet? Maybe we have membership dues that is for a membership's anniversary date, which doesn't coincide with the organization's fiscal year. So we haven't earned that membership revenue completely. So we've got to record some of that as deferred revenue. If you have any escrow or custodial liabilities or any loans and notes payable. Under net assets, we generally divide this into two sections. Net assets without donor restriction, which is our unrestricted. We've got operating net assets and we've got designated. Designated is usually designated by the board or the management team. Those are really unrestricted because the board and the management team can change those designations. They're the ones who determine how it gets used. Then we have net assets with donor restrictions. Now, those are restricted by the donor. If we accept this grant or this contribution, we agree to spend the money as the donor is intended. So normally we're going to list those out by grant or by contribution. This is where our endowments our balances are reported as well. Moving on to the statement of activities, which is our income and expenditures. As you can see, I've broken this down by revenue and I've got various sections, our different contribution revenue, our program services revenue, our other revenue. You're probably asking me where is investment income? I'll show you that in just a second. But we've also got what QuickBooks uses we call classes. This helps us with our statement of functional expenses, also helps us to keep track of what's the net income from our various programs. We've got classes. I've got a major class called programs. I'm creating subclasses for each program and my report is going to give me a total of my programs. Administrative in general is also going to be a class. If you have some various things that you want to track with administrative in general, I've got one client who wants to track board expenses separately. So we put board expenses and then we have other administrative in general. And then we have fundraising for the 990. If you have some major events, you're going to want to track the income and expense for those major events also to see how successful they were. Other fundraising costs and then we have our total. And then of course we have our grand total. So this is where the classes come in. This is what we're using the classes for. And then our accounts, we don't have to have all of grant income restricted for 
program number one or grant number one or whatever, because we can create these classes. So we've got revenue. The next section is expenses. And I've just followed the 990 here as far as the different groupings. Of course, you have grants and assistance to others, benefits paid to or on behalf of members. Then we're getting into compensation and we're splitting out our officer compensation from our other compensation. We've got benefits such as health insurance and retirement expense, payroll taxes. The next section is contract labor and I've divided that by category. We've got advertising and promotion. This can be things like your website or other advertising or promotional activities that you're doing. Under office expenses, I've got like our bank fees and our credit card transactions. Now, many of these credit card transactions, just to give you an example, are probably related to fundraising. So I would code this to bank fees and credit card transactions, but I would give it a class of fundraising so that it shows up in the fundraising column over here. Supplies, other office expenses, information technology, are we paying out any royalties? What are our occupancy expenses, our travel expenses? We've got conference, interest, payments to affiliates, depreciation insurance, and other. And that gives us our total expenses. So then we get our net operating revenue. So this is what it costs the net income from our organization of how we're doing over a certain period of time. And I like to include investment income in the other revenue section. So I have net investment income, which is our interest in our dividends, our realized gains and losses, our unrealized gains and losses, and then our management fees. And then I have keep separately our interest on our checking and our savings. So that gives us our net other revenue. If you have other expenses that you're looking at, we can create an other expense section. Sometimes this is where we like to do that release of restriction and we do those reclass entries into other expenses, but then we get our net income for the total organization. Now, one of the last things I wanna talk about is numbering. It is very helpful to number your accounts. This makes it very clear, like when you're coding things, you just have this little shorthand. This goes into checking is account 1,000. Everything goes in there. Contributions from individuals are 4,001. We know from those little shorthands, you don't have to write things out and it's very helpful. We have some standardization in the industry. So if we're looking at assets, those tend to be the 1,000s. And these can be, it could be 100, it could be 10,000. You can have as many digits as your software will allow. But you want to keep like the assets in the one grouping. Liabilities are generally 2,000s. Net assets are 3,000s. We've got revenue, depending on how many accounts you have, you could use the four to 5,000s. And then expenses six to eight thousands and then our other revenue and expenses are the nine thousands and using these can help you order your reports within QuickBooks so obviously when we're talking about assets we want the most liquid things to have the lowest number and our long-term assets to be like 1900 or something that is a very quick overview of the chart of accounts for QuickBooks I hope this has been clear. You can add, you can subtract. This is not a engraved in stone. It's very, in fact, we do different chart of accounts for every client. But if you have the main takeaways, use some numbering, put things in order of liquidity on the assets and at least have these categories for the 990. Use those classes to distinguish program administration and fundraising. And this will help you pull reports out of QuickBooks or your any other accounting system that you can use for managing grant applications and, of course, your compliance requirements. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope this was helpful for you. And if you have any questions on this or other topics, please let me know. We always appreciate your likes. And remember, creating a bigger impact starts with stopping the nonsense. If you're dealing with nonsense in your nonprofit organization, we'd love to help you cut through the noise.